Good morning. Please grab your Bibles and join me in Matthew chapter 6. We are studying the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We're in the second year of his ministry. We're at the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at the greater righteousness amongst ourselves. Now we're looking at the greater righteousness toward God. Last time, Jesus taught us how to pray. He gave us a model. He gave us a pattern, a framework. He didn't give us a script that we're to memorize and repeat ad nauseum and make it a vain repetition. He gave us a framework. And this time as we move on, he's going to give us a life lesson of which Scripture has a great deal to say. So, if we pick it up where we left off in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Uh, Two kinds of treasures, two kinds of wealth, if you will, are being contrasted here by the Lord. It is obviously earthly material wealth and heavenly immaterial spiritual wealth. And he starts by telling us that we should not gather, we should not amass, we should not store up treasures on earth because treasures on earth are eaten or consumed either by moths and other critters or by rust And the elements, either way, these things get eaten up, get consumed. The rust, for example, is oxidation, right? I'm looking to the scientists back here. It's oxidation. It's a slow burn. Rust is a slow burn. Everything's going to burn real quick at one point in time, but right now it's burning slowly. Uh, Any form of corrosion is an eating away. And that is what happens to things on earth. Uh, They also get stolen. Things that are of value get stolen. Maybe it's by some punk who bursts into your house and takes something that he wants. Or maybe it's by a sophisticated three-piece suit guy from Wall Street or even a government official. Uh, There's thieves everywhere. And treasures on earth get eaten or get stolen. Uh, Therefore, they are as the environment. The treasures on earth are as the environment. The earth. What's the condition of the earth? It's corrupt. It's been corrupted by sin. And as a result, it was what? By God. Cursed. And it is a finite thing. It has only a limited uh, time span. And someday it's going to vanish and everything else in it. And so the treasures of earth give us a false sense of security. Now, implied in verse 20, after the first word, but, uh, implied there is, I say unto you. Jesus has been saying that all along in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said of old time, but I say unto you. The direct teaching of the lawgiver himself, that's implied in verse 20. What he's saying is we should store up, we should gather up, we should amass treasures in heaven. And those treasures are impervious to decay and to consumption by critters or by the elements or anything. And thieves can't go there and take anything. And so the treasures in heaven are as that environment also. Because heaven is pure, unstained by sin. It is the dwelling place of God. It's a place of blessings and not cursings. And it Because he inhabits eternity, it's a place of infinite life. Uh, It will never vanish. And so the treasures that we gather up in heaven are eternally secure. Uh, The treasures on earth can, no matter how smart you are (laughs) or how much you got, Treasures on earth can never be secured. They can never be preserved. So ultimately they are what? Worthless. Ultimately they're worthless. Treasures on heaven, in heaven, on the other hand, are forever 
secured. They are forever preserved, and ultimately they are priceless and glorious. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The issue, Jesus points it up straight up, the issue relative to treasures, regardless of what kind, the issue with treasures is the heart, which is not the organ that pumps the blood. The heart is the, the very core of our being. It is, is that which drives us. It's those things that we desire the most. It is the very essence of our being. And our heart is tied to treasure, either on earth or in heaven. Because that treasure tells everybody, tells us, and of course it certainly tells the Lord, where our allegiances lie. My allegiance is to the world. And so I'm going to gather up all sorts of money and land and property. Or my allegiance is to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we sang, I will. You will what? Uh, whatever he wants. When? Whenever he wants. Where? Uh, wherever he wants. Allegiance. Treasure reveals the allegiance of our heart. And the word of God is really very clear. Number one, as it relates to earthly treasure, the Word of God says, do not covet. In fact, he wrote that with his finger in a table of stone. It's written in stone. Do not covet the things of this world. On the other hand, the Word of God also tells us to covet. We're told to covet. We're commanded to covet. What are we commanded to covet? the very best gift. We're to work to covet the things of God. Where does our, where does our treasure lie? Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. Uh, Proverbs written by, most of them written by King Solomon. When he was a youngster, if you will, after he'd been given the wisdom of God and he had everything that the world could offer, but he is inspired to write in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, Labor not to be rich. Cease from mine own wisdom, but thou set thine eyes upon that which is not. For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Money talks. What's it say? See ya. (laughs) Solomon knew that. God inspired him to write it for us. In Proverbs 27, verses 24, he says, point blank, riches are not forever. Isn't it better to have that which is forever than that which is not for forever? Uh, James, the son of Joseph and Mary, uh, was inspired to write in chapter 5, Go to now, ye rich men, weep. And howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. And what's the treasure they've been heaping? Fire. We read in First Timothy chapter 6 that... Better than riches on earth is godliness, which is contentment, and that the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, And that will get developed as we go through here. Uh, The Apostle Paul was commissioned to take the gospel to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And we know his mission trips, and we know his difficulties And one time when he was facing those difficulties in prison, he wrote a letter to a church in Philippi that was supporting him financially so he could do those things. And he said that he desired fruit that may abound to their account. I mean, the church in Philippi had an account in heaven. The bookkeeper in heaven was taking note of how they were providing materially for the spiritual work of his servant. We all have an account. In heaven. Uh, What's in it? Uh, Proverbs chapter 8. We should read that one, I suppose. Proverbs chapter 8. Let's 
starting in uh, verse 17. It says, I love them. And in the context, if you look at verse 1, does not wisdom cry? The I is wisdom. And we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, that Jesus Christ is made unto us as wisdom. So Jesus is speaking, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. Gold, silver is not substance. Righteousness is substance. The world teaches us that money is power. In the world, money is power. But that's what the world teaches. Uh, the, the world teaches us that money can buy happiness, that money can buy health, that he who dies with the most money and the most, to- most toys wins. Well, what is the experience without exception? Mr. Jones dies. He had a whole bunch of toys. He thought he won. He dies. And his neighbor says to someone at the funeral, how much, did he, how much did he leave behind? How much did he leave? And the answer, every penny. Every penny. That was true of the pharaohs. It's true of the Rockefellers. It's true of the Rothschilds. It's true of any and everybody. And when you think about the pharaohs, they put all this wealth in the tomb of their God because he would need it in the next life. And what happened to it? Grave robbers. So in Matthew 6, verse 19, where thieves break in and steal, uh, even happens then. Now, false teachers will tell you many things, but one of the things false teachers will tell you uh, is what's called a prosperity gospel. Jesus was, Jesus was rich, and he wants you to be rich. But what does the Word of God say, and what does the experience of mankind tell us. That's a spiritually bankrupt teaching. It bears bad fruit. It's a deception from the devil. So as we see here clearly in the Sermon on the Mount, arguably one of the most, if not the most important teaching by Jesus Christ, we see from his own words he does not care about earthly riches. They're burning now. And at some appointed time, they're going to burn in fervent heat. He doesn't care about earthly riches. What does he care about? Our hearts, our allegiance. And so the question, even just so far as we've read these things, where is my heart? Am I devoted? Am I all in on earthly treasures? Am I all in? on heavenly treasures? Or maybe do I think I can have it both ways and I'm straddling the fence that in reality doesn't even exist? The exhortations thus far by Jesus Christ, and all these things have eternal consequences, right? Uh, His exhortation is that we are to give him our complete and total and unconditional allegiance. And King Solomon understood that, too. He wrote in Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9, he says, and this is perhaps the wealthiest guy on earth is inspired to write these things. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies, and give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or, lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. Don't give me riches, because those things will steal my heart away from you. And don't give me poverty, because I'm going to have to steal to eat. He told me not to steal. So don't give me poverty, don't give me riches. Just give me contentment. 
godliness with contentment. Back to Matthew 6 then, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee it be darkness, how great is that darkness. Jesus is giving a physical metaphor for a spiritual truth. He's saying that the, the light, the illumination of our body is the eye. And if our eye is whole, if it's healthy, if it's undivided, if it's one, if it's single, then our body is full of light. But if our eye is diseased or degenerate or unhealthy, then the body is full of darkness. And what does that mean? (laughs) Light and darkness. Well, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And in 1 John, if you join me there, not the Gospel of John, but the first epistle of John, all the way toward the end of your Bible. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. If we slide down to verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him, meaning the life, the word of life, we've heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and with the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son cleanses us from all sin. Light is life. Therefore, what is darkness? Death. In Psalm 107, Psalm 107, starting in verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. To rebel against the words of God, to despise His counsel, is to know darkness and death. And the whole world was dark. And so, if you go back with me, to Luke chapter 1. The primary character is Zacharias. He's the father of John the Baptist. And this is after his son has been born, and therefore he's able to talk again. If you remember from our previous study, in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 67... And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us us in the house of his servant David, the son of David, the Messiah. He's raising up the Messiah. Uh, In verse 78, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring, the morning sun, from on high has visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet unto the way of peace. Light, life, darkness, death. God who is light brings light 
into a world that is filled with darkness. And we are in Matthew 6, but you go back there and turn to the left to chapter 4 at the beginning of his public ministry. Jesus is going to quote Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 in Matthew chapter 4, starting verse 12. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, that's John the Baptist, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in the darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the Galilee, he starts his public ministry, primarily a Gentile land, a land of darkness. People who rebelled against the counsel of God and sit in darkness, and to them a great light has appeared. Jesus Christ, who says, I am the light of the world. So going back to Matthew chapter 6, light and darkness are spiritual realities, far greater realities than the physical light and the physical darkness we're accustomed to. Light and darkness are spiritual realities, and Jesus is the light. He came into the world. And in Colossians chapter 1, we're told that we're giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, which is death, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, a kingdom of light, from darkness into light by the work of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, we're told, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, the Messiah, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. We've been delivered from the power of death. Death is darkness. That had the power of death, that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And so what Jesus is saying is that if we lay up treasures in heaven, our heart is linked to life, him. And our eye is single, it's whole, it's healthy, it's one with him. On the other hand, if we lay up treasures on earth, then our heart is linked with death. And we have what's called the evil eye. And in Jewish thinking, the evil eye is a way of describing uh, being miserly, being greedy, being covetous, and that's unhealthy. What Jesus is saying here, therefore, in verses 22, Two and 23 is that if the light and the life that is in us is treasures on earth, that light is really darkness. And we've been deceived by the prince of darkness. And oh, how great is that deception! King Solomon also wrote in Proverbs 28, verse 22, He that hastens to be rich has an evil eye and considers not that poverty shall come upon him. How does poverty come upon a rich man who has everything the world has to offer, has the world by the tail? How does a rich man become impoverished? Because he takes his last breath and he enters into darkness, death for all eternity. Do they hunt monkeys in the Philippines? Hunt monkeys. Okay. Okay. People do eat, or excuse me, 
They do hunt monkeys because they, they eat them. How, how, how do you hunt a monkey? You get a coconut. You carve a, a hole into it. You empty it. You put some treasure in it. And you let it out where the monkeys hang out. And the monkey will find it. And he'll reach his hand in. It's food, probably. And his hand goes in, but then he grabs the food and he can't get his hand out. Right? <laughs> what's, what's the end of the monkey? <laughs> because he will not, will not let go of the treasure. What are we told by the world to do relative to money and possessions and property? Uh, To seek them and to hold on to them and not let go. What's the prince of the world doing to people? He's hunting us. Let go. If the monkey had just let go of the treasure... Off he goes, safe and sound. Let go of the treasure and hold on to Jesus. And the hunter, our adversary, the devil, has no hold. Right? Verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot... Serve God and mammon. What does that tell us? What does that tell us about every person on earth? Every person on earth is a servant. Said another way, no person on earth is a master. It doesn't matter if your last name is Trump or Soros or Putin or Rothschild, or Rockefeller. No man is a master. Every man is a servant. And therefore, every man must choose which master they will serve. And here are the choices. There's only two. Will you serve God? Or you will serve mammon. Mammon is worldly riches. Uh, And mammon is a, a false... God and a very, very cruel taskmaster. And by his choice, a man is going to hate one of those and love the other, or he's going to despise one of those and hold on to the other. But Jesus said, no man can serve. You cannot serve. So to serve is to love. And to hold on to. And to not serve is to hate and to despise. There's no mixing and matching. You're going to love and hold on to the Lord, or you're going to love and hold on to mammon. And you're going to hate and despise the Lord, or you're going to hate and despise mammon. It's or. You can't have it both ways. You can't do both. You can't give total allegiance to but one. And therein lies the choice. Jesus is calling us to make our complete allegiance to him. The word of God tells us that God cannot fail. And the word of God and the experience of man tells us that mammon can, has, and will fail. So if I think about that, which is the logical, reasonable choice? To serve the Lord and not to serve worldly wealth. Uh, The men just got done recently studying Job. The women are currently studying Job. Uh, We, if you're familiar with the story, you know how it goes. Very wealthy man, godly man. The Lord gave him a glowing testimony before Satan. We know that things happened. God allowed these things to happen. And after he'd lost 10 children 
and everything that he had owned. Job said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He served the Lord. He did not serve the stuff. He was possessed by the Lord. He was not possessed by his possessions. Uh, and so, what about us? You know, are we money motivated? Or are we Christ motivated? Do we worry about money? Come on, who doesn't? (laughs) We do. (laughs) But is that worry just a, a fleeting thing? Or is it a consuming, every day, all day kind of a thing? I think we've all played the the what if. What is going to happen if I don't close this deal? What is going to happen if I lose my job? What ifs, all pertaining to money. Uh, We've all done that. And if you've done it enough times, you realize a couple things. Number one, God is faithful. Didn't we sing that? It's true. God is faithful. And we realize that mammon does not serve us. We serve mammon. We don't possess stuff. Stuff possesses us. And so mammon will choke the life out of us. Turn our world into darkness. Doesn't matter how much we have. A life of mammon is darkness. And if we faced with this choice, am I going to serve, love, hold on to God, or am I going to serve, love, hold on to mammon? If I choose to serve God, what does he give me? Contrary to what the prosperity gospel teachers will tell you, a whole bunch of money, no. What does he give me? Spiritual treasure, peace, contentment, joy, godliness, righteousness. If on the other hand I choose to serve mammon, what does mammon give me? A crushing anxiety and death. So if that's the choice, again, very simple choice. Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Taking a thought means to worry, to be anxious about, to be stressed out about, to be preoccupied with, to have a panic attack over, or to fall into depression about. Jesus says, don't do those things. Don't go there regarding the necessities of life. Food, drink, clothes, uh, Your Father in heaven, he knows you need those things. He gave you life. By putting your faith in me, he gave you life. He holds your breath in your hand, and he loves you so much, he sent me here to save you. Uh, He knows all that. Let him be your focus. Let him worry about all the other things. Just make him the center of your attention. And he gives us an example. The birds. Consider the birds. They don't do as humans do. They don't plant a field and water it and harvest it and store it up and try to get more and more and more. They don't do any of those things. But when was the last time you saw a bird keel over dead because of starvation? I have never seen it. How many birds are there? 
my mind can't get around that number. I have never seen a bird die of starvation. Oh, back in the day when we had a lawn and I reseeded it, how many birds showed up? I couldn't even see the grass. There are so many birds. And they had their fill and they went away and the grass came up anyway. The Lord knows. Birds don't lose any sleep over the accumulation of stuff. They don't lose any sleep over, am I going to get that next promotion or not? Uh, They don't lose any sleep about paying next month's mortgage. Why not? Because their little bird brains know that their creator is going to provide for them. And Jesus is saying, he didn't say it this way, but this is how I take it personally, have a bird brain. (laughs) Be a bird brain. Know that your Father in heaven is going to provide for you because you're so much more important than a bird, than all the birds even. He knows what you need, and he will provide it. We have a a ministry in Egypt that you may or may not know about. And if you don't, there are, and, and we have gone and we have seen and we have ministered, there are two million children between the ages of 5 and 15 living homelessly in the streets of Cairo. Does the Lord see them? Does he provide food and water for them? Yeah. Yeah. But he wants to do so much more. And that's where we come into play. So pray for those precious children. And, you know, we all have testimonies. We all have testimonies of how we were up against it financially, and the Lord came through. You're a 100% commission salesman. Yikes. Uh, I was a professional salesman for a long time, but never 100% commission. I never had that much faith, I guess. But... There was, and, and many times, you know, it's, in, in that profession, it's a profession where you learn faith, first of all. Uh, either things are going real well or they're going real bad. But the bills continue and usually even increase. A uh, number of times we were up against it. I remember being on a, a business trip down to Tucson and I was sitting up, it was, I was in an embassy suites, which means what? Free breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> And I had mine, and I was outside because it was, it was May, it was beautiful. And I was reading Psalms 46 through 49. I just commit those to you to read them later. 46 through 49, I was reading those. And we were going through it. We were really going through it. And I'm crying out to the Lord, and I look up, and you know what I see? A sparrow sitting on my table. And he's looking at me, and he's looking at my donut. My donut. You want my... He's looking at me. He's looking at my donut. And boom, like a thunderclap. This passage of Scripture came to mind. And I was instantly relieved. Nothing had changed, but I was instantly at peace. And yes, I shared my donut with that sparrow. (laughs) Thanked him for being obedient to the Lord to teach me a simple, simple yet profound lesson. And you all have things like that where the Lord somehow came through. You could not have orchestrated it. You could probably not even written the script that way, but he did. And so we all know God is faithful and these things are true. And so we need to take to heart the things that Jesus is saying, that the life, his life, given to us by grace through faith, and that not ourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. His life in us is more important than food or drink or clothes or any other material thing on earth. And worrying about those things, who's worried? Come on. I'm the only worrier around here. Who's worried? Who has seen worry do anything for you? Has it ever helped? (laughs) Did you ever worry about something that never happened? Well, isn't that almost always the case? 
Worry doesn't help. It's not healthy. It, cre- it, it, it creates stress. And stress is physically damaging to us. And so Jesus is caring for us, loving us, when he's telling us not to be stressed about things. Uh, all that worry is an exercise in futility. And that worry in, in his heart, in his ears, our worry is doubt. We don't believe. Or we don't believe enough. Or we're not sure it's actually going to happen this time. The devil uses it to rip us off, to steal our joy, and to cause us to forget who our Father is, who our provider is, and how much he loves us, and how much he values us, and how faithful he is. This is a life lesson, the life of Christ And how to live in this life. If we go to Luke chapter 12. These things are a matter of the heart. And God cares about our heart. Luke 12. Starting in verse 15. This is Jesus speaking. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. In fact, he wrote with his finger in stone, Do not covet. Beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and I will build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. To lay up treasure on earth is to be self-serving. To lay up treasure in heaven is to be God-serving. In Matthew 16... The scene is Caesarea Philippi. And after he's done with Peter, for what Peter says, inspired by the Father, and what Peter says as if he's listening to the devil, uh, we'll pick it up in verse 24 of Matthew 16. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, be self-serving, make sure I got enough stuff, shall lose his life, shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life, your will be done, Father. Whatever, whenever, wherever, shall lose his life for my sake, shall find it. And what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. If the guy who knows the art of the deal makes deals and owns the whole world, and, but serves himself in so doing and does not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, what good does it do him when he's taken his last breath? It's all lost. Life comes by trusting Jesus Christ. Death comes by trusting self, by trusting the things of the world. Back to chapter 7, excuse me, chapter 6 then. Verse 28, 
Another example. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Uh, Total devotion to him. Not devoted to the things of the world. Another example. The lilies of the field. Uh, The wildflowers. Uh, I mean, why do you get, he's, he's asking us, why do you get stressed out about what to wear? Why do you walk into your closet filled with clothes and say, I've got nothing to wear? <laughs> the wildflowers don't do anything, but look at them. They're more beautiful than Solomon in all his splendor. And if the the Father cares about the wildflowers, if he cares about the grass, which is here today and gone tomorrow, how much more will he care for us? Hmm? A rhetorical question. And who is Jesus speaking to? Ye of little faith. It doesn't say the absence of faith. It says a weak faith. A faith that questions, knows, Knows what these things say, but a a faith that questions or doubts or maybe just simply refuses to not be in control. How many of us like to be in control? How many of us are? You've heard me say before, I was trained to be in control occupationally. I knew it wasn't true. But I was trained to be that way. And when I heard these words for the first time, it was liberation. It's liberating to not be in control. It's crushing to think that you are in control because you're not in control. God is in control. Now, that doesn't mean we're not to work. We are commanded to exert productive energy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. If you don't work, you don't eat. So yes. And, and God created man and gave him a job. We are to exert productive energy as we walk with him, but we're not to exert anxious. Oh my goodness. The sky is falling kind of energy because that's harmful. He provides for the birds. He provides for the wildflowers. He's going to provide for us. And we all probably, as I said earlier, we all have our testimonies that he is faithful. We need to remember those things. Our security is not in the stuff on earth that we gather. If I had, and I don't, (laughs) if we had a million bucks in the bank, I would be no more secure if I had a dollar in the bank. Because our security doesn't come in the stuff. It's a false sense of security. Our genuine security comes only in our creator, our provider, and our sustainer. We need to keep our perspective. So, verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Jesus has a cure for worry for anxiety that this world stimulates. He has a cure. Number one, let it go. You're not in control. You've never been in control and you're never going to be in control. So let it go. Number two, know. 
Know that your Father knows that you need the bare necessities of life. <laughs> what's, what, what's the movie? Jungle Book. <laughs> David, when he was an old man, wrote Psalm 37, and he said, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed, nor his children begging for bread. He'd never seen those who are serving, loving, holding on to the Lord. He's never seen one of them go hungry. Know that your father knows what you need. Number three, first things first. What's the first thing? Seek. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord like Ezra did. He prepared his heart. Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. He prepared his heart to seek the law. And in so doing, you get the lawgiver. He prepared his heart to do it and to teach it. Seek to serve, to love, to hold on to the Lord. Seek his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. Righteousness is a treasure in heaven. It's his. He's the only one that has it. Seek his righteousness. Seek his kingdom. In the parallel passage in Luke, uh, Luke says, you know, fear not, little flock, for your father, it's, it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We have a loving father. He desires to give us the kingdom. He desires to give us his riches. Seek those things. He'll give those things to you because that's the most important, and therefore he's obviously going to take care of the little things, all the little daily things. Bothers like, oh, what am I going to eat next? Or what am I going to wear? He'll take care of all those things. And number four, as a cure for worry and anxiety, is uh, don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. There's trouble tomorrow. Don't borrow. Because today's already got enough trouble. Why do you want more trouble? Do we live in the tomorrow? No, the future belongs to the Lord. He has not given it to us yet. Do we live in the past? No, it's gone. We we can't go back there, and we can't go to the future. What do we have? The present. That's all we ever have. We never have the future. All we ever have is the present. We have right now. We have today. And so what is it that you're worried about? What is it that's causing you this crushing anxiety? Can you give it to the Lord today? Can you trust Him today that He can take care of it? Yeah, I can do that today. Good, then do it. But what about tomorrow? You have today. And then you go to bed and you wake up and what what day is it? Today. Can you do it today? Yeah, one day at a time, as they're given to us, we can do what the Lord has called us to do. So this life lesson, it requires faith. It requires perspective. It requires his perspective and not ours. And it, it, this last exhortation in Matthew chapter 6 from Jesus, uh, we have to make a decision Am I going to trust slash lean on money or am I going to trust, lean on Jesus? Money is like this mic stand. If I lean on it, how many, want you, how many of you want me to see, see me do that? <laughs> Repent! <laughs> if I lean, if this is money and I'm leaning on it, where am I going? I'm going down. And as fast as gravity will take me. 
And by the way, leaning doesn't mean... Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm trusting. No, leaning means put your whole weight on. What if I decide to lean on Jesus? Am I going down? Never. So, should I lean on money or should I lean on Jesus? It's so simple, yet it's so hard. It's got to be a work of the Spirit. If I, if I hold on to money as tightly as I can, what's it going to do? Fly away. If I lean on to Jesus as tight as I can, what's he doing? He's holding on to me tighter than I'm holding on to him. So I'm better holding on to money or to Jesus? Jesus. Which master do I need more? Because I, those are the two choices. I'm not a servant. I mean, I am a servant. I'm not a master. I'm either going to have God as my master or money as my master. Which master do I need? I need the Lord. I don't need money. Don't need it. I need Jesus. Who knows what I need and is faithful to give it to me. So, verse 21, again, just some of the highlights in this passage. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. In verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, what part does money play in your life? What part does Jesus Christ play in your life? Well, why don't we break into small groups and pray about just that. And after we've done that for five minutes or so, we will close with a song. Amen?